So we're looking at mechanical energy. This spring mass combination or setup here is a great example of mechanical energy uh, because it shows really the three different essential forms that make up mechanical energy. When we consider mechanical energy, it is defined as the sum of all the potential and kinetic energies on an object. So for this class, the potential en energies you're going to be involved with are gravitational, of course, spring energy, and then, of course, kinetic energy is not a potential, but it's this mechanical energy is defined as the sum of those three. And that's important because in a situation like this, where we have, say, the spring going like that, we're going to make use of the uh, conservation of energy, but more specifically, a um, situation where the mechanical energy can be conserved. In other words, where the sum of these three is always the same number. That's what it means when something's conserved. And in this case, we can do that. We can say the sum of these three will always be the same number. Situations where we can't is where friction is involved. So you know, is there a little bit of, of, as this thing stretches, there is some friction between the molecules, and eventually this will slow down and stop. But you'll notice it's actually maintaining a pretty good um, constant rate of oscillation. The rate will always be the same, actually. We'll learn that. But it's keeping about the same amplitude um, because there really isn't a lot of friction involved right now. And in situations where we can ignore the friction, where we don't have to worry about any energy going to friction, we can say that this number, the mechanical energy, is conserved. It's always the same. So really what you want to picture, as you see this going on, is these three quantities just passing the numbers, the, the, the energy, back and forth between each other. So at any given moment, though, they are going to, always going to add up to be the same number. So that's a, an important overriding um, thing right here. When we know mechanical energy is conserved, we know that these three numbers have to add up to the same number all the time. And so, for example, if I know at the highest point here, well, let's go with the lowest point, we'll say. So at this lowest point, it has, it may have a potential energy that's as low as it's going to get. It's as far down as it's going to get, so we'll say zero potential. But its spring energy is a maximum. What about the kinetic energy? Hmm, that's also zero, isn't it? Because right, it's stopped at that point, at its lowest point, right? When it gets that lowest point, it's going to be stopped. So in that case, if I knew the spring energy, if I knew how far it was stretched from, let me find it, from its equilibrium, I know all the en all the energy that's in the spring itself. So certain places in this are easier to figure that out. And if I did that when it was all the way at its lowest point, if I found that spring energy. I would know the mechanical energy. And if it's conserved, no matter where it is, I would now know what the sum of these three would have to be. So even in between here, even somewhere where it isn't stopped, like say right in here when it's moving upward, it would have some kinetic, it would have the spring is stretched, have some spring energy, it's got some gravitational potential energy, but I know this. Those three are going to add up to that number we mentioned a little bit ago, where the spring energy at the farthest point. So this is the general idea behind it. But for mechanical energy, the key here is to remember that it is the sum of some mechanical energy is your sum of all the potential energies and the kinetic energies of an object. So if there's spring energy, there's that, gravitational, and kinetic. Now, does there have to be a spring involved? No. Um, does there have to be gravity involved? If you recall in the previous video, if you were watching that, um, here we didn't have to worry about any change in gravitational potential energy because it was always the same. It was always the same height. Um, if you're considering uh, an airplane, right? Airplane, this is my attempt at an airplane. There we go. Considering an airplane, it's not going to have spring energy, but it will have quite a bit of mechanical energy due to its gravitational potential energy and to the fact that it has kinetic. So you don't have to have all three. Um, not every situation will. But the sum of all of them, even if one of them is zero, 
is what's called mechanical energy. And we're going to look at situations when it's, where it's conserved and how to look at situations when it's, not cons when it's not conserved. Keep in mind, mechanical energy is, you're, it's possible to have that be not conserved. Energy overall is always conserved until you get to E equals MC squared and nuclear physics, but don't worry about that right now. Don't worry about it. Just go with energy is always conserved. It'll suit you well. But mechanical energy, eh, it depends on the situation. Some situations we can clearly look at it and, and for that problem say, you know what, mechanical energy is conserved, boom. Others, it'll be pretty clear that it's not. How will you know? Well, let's go to the one that, the energy form that's going to take away mechanical energy. That, that Notice in that sum for mechanical energy, thermal energy was not there. The energy of heat, the energy that you get when you rub your hands together, that's, you, they feel warm. That's thermal energy. Um, you can get it from other sources. You, when you light, of, when you light a fire, you're turning chemical potential energy into thermal energy. For us, friction is really the one we want to consider. And even within the spring, you can see we're starting to lose that energy, and that's because the friction was between the molecules in the spring, it's warmer. If you ever tried this before, if you take a rubber band and you, you stretch it and put it against your forehead, it'll be warmer um, than before you stretched it. So you actually, if you do that long enough, the rubber band will get warm. So there is some friction between the molecules. Energy that ends up going through friction into thermal energy doesn't count as mechanical energy, and so I, you'll often hear us you know, use the word, say the phrase, loss to friction. It's not that the conservation of energy is being violated, but the conservation of mechanical energy cannot be assumed. So if an object is, let's say, sliding down an incline, probably the best example I can give you right now. So let's just go with um, some sort of ramp or incline and some object sliding down it. So at the beginning, say it's released from rest, it has gravitational potential energy, and we would say, all right, if I know that, and it has no kinetics, so we're letting it go from rest, and there's not a spring involved, then that is the mechanical energy at the beginning. Whatever the gravitational energy, potential energy was at the beginning. We'll use a little zero for that. Now, if there's no friction, if we, the problem says, hey, it's a frictionless incline, then by the time that gets to the bottom, let's see, we're going to clone it. When it gets down here, all of that mechanical energy will now be in a different form, but it will be the same amount of energy. Whatever this is, if there's no friction, so no friction, no energy lost, so to speak, to thermal, thermal energy, then I can say mechanical energy initial has to equal mechanical energy final. And down here, since it's down to zero height, we would say that would be all in the form of kinetic energy. And you can see conservation of energy makes that much easier to do. But what if there is friction? Well, if there is friction, I can't say this. I'm going to have less mechanical energy down here if there's friction. So in the case where there's friction, let's just kind of duplicate this down here. So similar or same situation if you'd like. Let's say there is friction. So here's your block. It has a certain amount of potential energy and a certain amount of mechan mechanical energy at the start. As it slides down, if there's friction, will it still have all of that mechanical energy? And the answer is no, because some of that energy would have gone to thermal energy through friction and isn't available for kinetic or potential. And if you're wondering about this situation, like when you stop your car, I can't tell you the number of times when I say to students, so you're driving along in your car and you hit the brakes, where does that kinetic energy go when you stop? And how many of them just automatically say, ooh, potential energy? And then you've got to ask yourself, when you came to that red light and you stopped, were you 20 feet in the air? Like, is that what stopped you? Was it? No. They just say it automatically because they think, oh, kinetic because they're so locked into problems always saying that kinetic potential energy turns into kinetic. Well, that's true if the mechanical energy is conserved. In the case where you slam on your brakes and come to a stop, all of that kinetic energy is now in thermal energy. Your brakes are hot. You don't want to go touch them. Don't get out of your car and go touch your brakes. Just to prove it to yourself, 
Just trust me. It's fine. Well, in this case, maybe not all of that energy goes to thermal energy. It might still have some kinetic energy here, but if there's friction, that kinetic energy isn't equal to the beginning potential. We would say the mechanical energy initially is equal to whatever the mechanical energy is later on plus any energy lost to a non-conservative force. Now, how do we phrase that? How do we, in a formula, how do I phrase any energy lost to some, or gained, we'll talk about that in a second, by a non-conservative force? Friction is just one example, and we're going to talk about non-conservative and conservative in a second, actually. So, plus, whatever goes to, I'm just going to write thermal here right now. In this situation, it's thermal energy. Well, we'll look at situations where it doesn't have to necessarily be thermal energy. But we certainly would say that they're not equal to each other if there's friction. That's the, one of the important things I want you to keep in mind. So let's look at this last little bit about conservative and non-conservative forces. So some forces in physics are called conservative forces, some are non-conservative. Definition. So first of all, let's just give examples. Conservative forces are things like gravity and the spring. They are, the forces they provide are what's called conservative forces you can get that energy back. When I do work against gravity, when I take this, this mass here, let me get, make myself bigger, there we go. All right, so if I take this mass and I do work against it, I lift it up, that energy, that work that I just did, it isn't gone. It's stored in the potential energy of this. And if I want it back as kinetic energy, I just let it go. So, but the work I did against gravity is stored. Likewise, the work I do by stretching this spring is stored. No, I'm not going to let it go. That would hurt. But you get the idea. It's stored. Whereas, if I take this mass and... Well, let's do it this way. We'll do it this way. If I push on this table, if I slide my hand across the table, when I, I let go, nothing happens because... That energy wasn't stored in any form. It was just turned into thermal energy. My hand and the table are a little bit warmer. It's gone. Gone. All right. so I'm not saying the energy is, dis is gone, but I'm saying as far as conservative, I can't get it back. It is in thermal energy, and now there's no way of getting that back. So conservative forces are ones in where you, if you do work against them, they store that energy. And you can get it back in some other form, a falling object or you know, letting the spring go. Generally, it turns back into kinetic. Non-conservative forces, the energy is gone. But here's another way to look at it. Non-conservative forces could also be a force like um, when, a, when a plane takes off. They burn the fuel and they push it out the back. And that Newton's third law, the hot, the hot gas is going out the back, push the plane forward. That force by the engines of the plane is a non-conservative force. It's not friction, but it wasn't energy that was stored as a spring energy or as gravitational potential energy. So non-conservative forces, they don't always have to do negative work. Right? Think about it. Gravity did negative work this way, right? I put, it moved upward. Gravity tried to pull it downward. That's negative work. As I stretch this spring, this, I do positive work, but the spring does negative. But in the case of the jet engine, it does positive work because it, it pushes the plane forward and that's the direction the plane moves. So the force and the two are the same. So non-conservative forces are oftentimes friction and oftentimes the work done by them is negative. But there are a few problems in there where, where the forces are non-conservative and are positive. Here, let me give you another example. It just popped into my head. So, if I push on this, the force by me is a non-conservative force. It just, it's work done by me that's added energy into the system. So, that will be a non-conservative force. In fact, there's two non-conservative forces here. Because if I push it and it slides to a stop, my original work done, moving it from, say, here to here when I let it go, that bit of work turns into kinetic energy, and it came from non-conservative force of me, pushing, and then goes, loses that kinetic energy to thermal energy through the non-conservative force of friction.
Compare that to if, now there's friction here, so you're going to have to bear with me. I'm not sure this is going to work. But if there were no friction, compare that to if I do work, well, here, actually, let's do it this way. Let's say I go back to this situation. Here, if I compress, when I was compressing that object back, I got this. When I was taking that block and squeezing it back there, that work by me, which was non-conservative, was stored in the conservative force of the, uh, of the spring. Was that en my energy in became the energy in the spring. My energy here becomes the kinetic energy, and eventually friction does its thing, and it becomes thermal energy. All right. You know, let's finish this off. So, any, so applied forces, some examples of conservative forces, any force of gravity, force by a spring. They're the, the key ones. Non-conservative forces, common one is friction. But other ones, any kind of an applied force, um, tension on an elevator cable, that's a, that would be a non-conservative force. So friction forces, applied forces, that sort of thing. Really, anything that isn't gravitational potential, oh, sorry, the gravitational force or um, the spring force. So, oops. sorry if that was loud when I dropped my mic. Which brings us to conservation of mechanical energy. I have mentioned, started to mention it earlier. Let's wrap it up. So, mechanical energy is conserved. In other words, always the same from start to end to the middle. It's always the same when you can look at it two ways. When only non, sorry, only conservative forces act. Or conversely, there are no non-conservative forces. Or another way to look at that, if you would like, is this. And this is probably the, the key. Is the work done by non-conservative forces is zero. When there is no work done by a non-conservative force. No friction doing work. Nobody doing positive work by pushing on it. It's just either a force by a spring or a force of gravity, that sort of thing. So in this case, this is when we can say that mechanical energy is conserved. We can say mechanical energy is not conserved, of course, when non-conservative forces act. In other words, the work done by non-conservative forces isn't zero. Could it be positive? Yes. Could it be negative? Sure. It depends. But it is certainly not zero. So when this isn't zero, when they tell you friction's present or that uh, there's think there's a problem with a person with a jetpack or something, that force by the jetpack is a non-conservative force. Um, when a non-conservative force acts, you know that your mechanical energy at the beginning isn't going to be the same as it is at the end. And so here's the overall, uh, I guess, way or equation of looking at it would be this. So the most succinct way to put this is that your me mechanical energy that you have initially is going to equal the mechanical energy you have after that as if there's no, no work done by non-conservative forces. And if there is work done by non-conservative forces, friction or somebody pushing on it or something like that, then what you have at the beginning is going to equal what you have at the end plus whatever work or minus, depending on whether the work is positive or negative, the work done by non-conservative forces. So if you can somehow figure out how much work was done by friction or by whatever else, and if there's more than one, by their combined efforts, 
if you can figure out that net work done by non-conservative forces, then that plus the mechanical energy you have at the end will equal what you had at the beginning. So you could have more mechanical energy at the end. In the case of a rocket ship taking off, it doesn't have a lot of mechanical energy. In fact, none, because it's on the ground. It's not moving. The engines fire. They do a huge amount of non-conservative work, but it's all positive because the rocket ship takes off. And you might have a larger mechanical energy at the end. Or it could be someone sliding down a slide, like we mentioned earlier. And if that's the case, their mechanical energy here would be large. Down here, they might have less. And you, the difference between them would be the work done by the non-conservative force of friction at that point, the work done by friction, which makes sense because friction would have applied a force over that distance, would have done work. So this general idea is a good way of looking at um, the conservation of mechanical energy. And there's a lot of problems where that will be used. There's a lot of situations where they will say things like, oh, there's no friction. And, and read the problem carefully. There's no friction. It's probably a good sign that there won't be any work done by a non-conservative force. And you just end up with this statement. Mechanical energy initially has to equal the mechanical energy final.